Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to the uh, to Salty Cinema. I'm Stuart Sandin. I'm a professor of marine ecology here at Scripps. I'm also the director of our Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. Uh, I can't tell you how beautiful it is and wonderful it is to see you all in person, uh, to be able to welcome uh, everybody to uh, our first post, well, post event, let's just say, event. Uh, and I want to welcome everybody who's online right now because we're hosting this as a hybrid event. I want to thank everybody who is here during the Salty Cinema events that happened during the last couple of years that participated remotely. And that was an inspiration for us to realize that we had a lot of folks interested in marine facing content that might not be able to be here in San Diego. So thanks everybody for being here. So Salty Cinema is a program of, of uh, the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation and is being led in this, in this case brainchild of our students of the Master of Advanced Studies in Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. Our uh, professional master's students have been our creative bunch, coming from backgrounds of education, research, uh, military, uh, and all across the ocean sphere. The uh, alumni, the MAS, MBC alumni, really kept this, this program running for years. And we're really happy that, that a number of the current students have, have taken up the reins and are kicking some butt on creating some really great ocean-facing content. Uh, this, year's, uh, this, uh, this event's theme is Water People Above and Below the Surface, which will feature stories of the human relationship of the ocean through recreation and livelihood. Uh, we're going to view five short films followed by an interactive discussion with our panelists. That's the best part. Moderated by Ellen Spooner. Thank you. Uh, Ellen's a communicator, conservationist, and host of the Ocean Optimism podcast. So she knows how to uh, navigate a conversation. Uh, just a heads up for those of you here uh, or online with uh, uh, sensitive ears nearby. Uh, this is Salty Cinema, and the second video is featuring some salty language. So that might be the film to cover some ears, ear muffing your way through. Uh, for those of you tuning in online, we want to welcome the conversation. We want to welcome you to the event. We want to welcome you to uh, ask questions. So along the way, you have the opportunity to archive, record your questions in the Q&A feature. So please put them in there. We will address, we'll try to address them all, but please put them in when you think of them. If you're here in person, please don't shout them out along the way because that's super distracting in person. So the people online, they win in this case. Uh, we're going to, um, the, the film screening and the panel are scheduled to wrap up at 6 o'clock Pacific time. After 6 o'clock, for those of you who are here, you're welcome to join a reception where we get to talk some more about this. Um, with that, let me hand it over, and I uh, hope you enjoy Salty Cinema Post Problems. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sean Wolf. Our film, The Salty Generations, is about the different challenges that aquaculture farmers across generations in the state of California face and their motivation for providing sustainable food for their communities. I hope you enjoy it. I never really set out to become a mussel farmer. It really came from within. I grow oysters and mussels about a mile off the coast, and uh, I'm an offshore shellfish farmer. None of us not to grow anything anymore. We, 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 just, we just go to the store and it just magically appears. We, we don't know where it comes from, how it's made, you know, what the, you know, we, we, there's no sweat, blood, and tears. Just sort of thinking about how we're going to feed you know, twice as many of us, and how we're gonna figure out, you know, how to not destroy the earth as much as we've destroyed the earth in the past hundred years. You know, you, you, you can see that like, you know, farming in the ocean really has a future. 
We are the third biggest shellfish consuming state in the United States and we, uh, we produce less than half of that, uh, that product locally. In the regulatory context in which shellfish aquaculture operates in California is incredibly complex. It really doesn't benefit anyone, certainly not the growers, and it really um, does predispose the industry to favor large-scale growers over sort of mom-and-pop growers, whereas the smaller growers actually may be much better for the environment. The small tastes of office jobs that I've had, it's just not a good fit. I think that I've always gravitated towards agriculture. One of the main reasons is getting to be outside and getting to learn from nature. You know, seaweed farming is a perfect fit. That kind of lifestyle and that kind of job is something that I think we all would love to have and we're working really hard to see like how can we make this work. I'm Avery. I'm Catherine. I'm Tessa. We're Salt Point Seaweed, a seaweed company based in California. If you actually know the people who are growing your food, chances are you're going to be supporting a more equitable system because if it wasn't, you would see it. I've just seen uh, local food systems that are more environmentally sustainable. You know, I think like the food piece of it is where all of our hearts are and we're so excited about producing food that's local and nutritious. I think when we first pitched this project to Zane, farm manager at Hog Island, he said, yeah, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And we said, yep, if you're okay with us making a lot of mistakes, like, great. And we've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and learned a lot from them. <laughs> My biggest success is that I understood that I would screw it all up. Like, I understood that, like, look, I'm not the brightest guy. Um, I'm gonna make a ton of mistakes. We don't give the, uh, the people doing the permitting that room to, to make mistakes. We don't do that. Like, there's no room for error. And they, they make it so tight. They make the regulations so tight you know, I can't make a mistake, they can't make a mistake, and so we're all making a huge mistake by not admitting that we're, that we're human beings. I have to be realistic that, you know, I may not be doing what I'm doing next month. There's so many things that can go wrong with my business that there's a pretty good chance that I won't be doing it next year. You really have to be emotionally connected to what you do to be a successful fisherman or a farmer. And so people don't understand that it's not just a job, it's, it's an extension of who you are and, and what you believe in and, and uh, the risks you take and the, um, the amount of effort you give it is uh, beyond most rational thinking. I could probably make more money and um, have a safer existence not doing what I do, but it, what I do is irrational to me, but it's just something that comes from, you know, from within. So it's, uh, it's emotional. Our dream for producing food in California really revolves around a local food system where the growing of food supports the local environment both environmentally and through supporting the communities. The generation before us and before that, folks who are 
in aquaculture right now and have been for 30 something years. There's so much that they know that we're slowly, slowly learning from them. The challenge for me is to get other people farming anything in the ocean. And I think there's plenty of room to, to do that. Seaweed farming is definitely in our future. Shellfish farming, definitely in our future. Feeding people and having people thank you and, and enjoy your food and being a part of that community of providing food is vastly rewarding. Hi everyone, my name is Sachi Cunningham and I'm the director of She Change. It's a feature length documentary about four of the world's best female big wave surfers and their fight for pay equity in one of the most dangerous sports on earth. What you'll see today is a trailer for the film which is still in production. So if you'd like to learn more, I'd love to hear from you and I hope you enjoy what we're screening today. Thanks so much for watching. I'm drawn to big waves. They're just the most beautiful, amazing, scariest things ever. Seeing that blue crystal wall rise into you and closing and just being a part of it. It takes me to such a place of being present and feeling so alive. It forces you to be in the moment. Any deviation is death. Up next, a visit to a cove in Northern California, where on very rare occasions, conditions produce waves that are larger than anywhere else on Earth. They call it Mavericks. It certainly is the premier big wave spot in California and arguably the entire world. The rocks, the cold, the reef itself, how steep and hollow the wave is. The waves that explode with such force that they register on the Richter scale. It's killed the best in the world. One of the surf world's biggest events gets underway this morning under a wave of controversy. In the 17 years since the competition was first held, only men have competed. Jeff Clark was the first to surf the spot back in 1975. He went on to start the now classic competition. It's not a gender thing, it's a performance thing. Women just aren't there yet. Bianca Valentini disagrees. Those arguments saying there aren't enough women, they don't serve well enough, those excuses don't work anymore. It's just kind of comical. It's like, you're telling us that we don't deserve to be out there? Have you seen the waves that we ride? We call ourselves the badass big wave bitches. <laughs> Hashtag that. You got Carola. I think she is the best big wave surfer in the world. She's ridden some of the craziest waves that anyone has ever ridden. Andrea Muller, she's just an all-around water athlete. She's a paramedic, and she is such a great mom. Bianca's just such a talented surfer. She's like a frothing grom when it comes to chasing swells. And then Paige, she is like an Amazonian. She's very tall and strong. She really put her entire life to be where she's at right now. And then Sabrina, she's like a pit bull. She's gonna fight till the end for what's right. As big wave surfers, these women have to spend an incredible amount of time training, working to realize a dream to have women compete at Mavericks. 
Growing up, I had these dreams of being Kelly Slater and getting to surf at all these huge contests and events that you see in the magazines and in the movies. And then you realize at a certain point that you can't because you're not gonna have the opportunity. They were great athletes and we would watch them and learn, but there was no space for us. The inequity in surfing has always been there in the media. Never seeing a female unless it's a girl on the beach in a bikini. It was like, oh, well, you're just not marketable. Oh, that's your nice way of saying I'm over 30 and I'm a lesbian. A lot of women, they don't have sponsors. They have real jobs, you know, traveling halfway around the world costs a lot of money. We need equal access and competitions and equal pay in those events. Without that, you can't really get to be your best performing self. We're out there surfing the same conditions and the dangers are the same. You can still get caught inside by a 60 foot wave and be dead. Why should we get paid less to do the same thing? If we want this, we have to do it on our own. If you're closing down the coastline for the whole day, you have an all men's event, then you're effectively excluding women from using public resources. The California Coastal Commission voted to require Clark and his team to come up with a plan to allow women in the competition by next year. When we took it a step further, we decided to ask for equal pay. WSL said they couldn't afford it. The Committee for Equity in Women's Surfing, we stood strong and said, no, it has to be equal. What an epic opportunity to be able to be the first event ever to have equal pay and equal opportunity for women. But I just knew that something wasn't right. They're axing Mavericks from the tour. The male athletes blame her. If it weren't for having to pay the women's prize money, they wouldn't have cut Mavericks. It's upsetting to have people who you have showed nothing but respect blatantly diss you in the face. Like, I'm not gonna be a dick, but I'm fucking tempted now. To fight for something that I know is right, I'm not gonna give up. We have a lot to lose from this fight, but we're not gonna give up until we have a spot on the lineup. Hi, this is Andrea and Lindsay and we're with Surfgrass Productions. Today you'll be watching our film Shared Seas. Shared Seas explores marine protected areas and equitable access to the coast. Thank you so much and enjoy. My name is Anupa. I'm an avid water woman, recreational fisher, and an ocean advocate. I learned how to fish from my dad, and I think my dad has taught most of my family how to fish, along with um, people in the town that I grew up in, young and old. I grew up fishing the Gulf Coast, like the flats of, of Florida for something called red drum and speckled trout. Um, and now I am learning how to be a surf fisher, which has been really challenging and exciting. So surf fishing is basically fishing from shore, from the beach and casting out into the surf. So there are breaking waves and, you know, the depth of the water is always changing based on what, you know, if it's a set wave coming in or how high the surf is. I think the thing that is the most different is, you know, when you're fishing from a boat, you kind of know where your line's going to go or if you're drifting or not. But fishing from shore, like within a single cast, it's way more dynamic and the conditions are changing. So I think it's really been a test of my skills or lack thereof. I always struggle when I do catch a fish. It's like this feeling of victory, like you figured it out and you did it and you won a battle. But at the same time, um, I do have this respect for the environment and you have this mixed feeling of gratitude as well for 
for this fish giving itself to you, <laughs> to sustain you and give you a meal. I don't keep everything I catch. If you know I haven't had fish for a while, I might keep something. Um, if it's lobster season and I go for a lobster dive, I'll, I'll keep a few. It's kind of funny though because I, the first comment I usually get when I get out of the water, especially usually go at night for lobster diving, is like, "Wow, I've never seen a girl here before." Um, and then you know they'll always say, "Oh, we got our limit. We got all seven, And I'll just come out with you know one or two. Sometimes I only found one or two, but often I do see a lot more and I choose not to take as many as I can because I feel fine letting them stay in the ocean. I only need to take what I, what I can eat. We have areas that are restricted and areas that we can't fish or take things from. Um, it actually benefits the overall health of our ocean and what we're able to catch elsewhere. So a lot of fishers, I think, are supportive of having rain-protected areas and having these places where the ocean can heal and recover and replenish. The U.S. federal government and the state of California have both committed to protecting 30% of land and 30% of coastal waters by the year 2030. This is a goal we commonly refer to as 30 by 30. And reaching this minimum target of 30 by 30 will help maintain global biodiversity and defend against the climate crisis by preserving the integrity of ecosystems that are so essential to sustaining us on this planet into the future. Not all marine protected areas are created equal. Some are just declared marine protected areas and there is very little enforcement and people kind of ignore the rules. Um, we often call those paper parks. Some protected areas like our state marine reserves in California are fully protected, meaning you can't take anything from these places. They, we would call them like an insurance policy for the rest of the ocean. In California, um, our Fish and Game, our State Fish and Game Commission has the authority to designate MPAs, but anytime an MPA or our current, even with our current MPA network, um, it's always done through public process. So everyone has a say in it. Um, from where it goes to how big it is to um, what you can and can't do there. All of these are opportunities for the public to have a say in, in our marine protected area process and network. Equitable access for fishing and, and people who rely on the ocean for sustenance, I think involves including indigenous communities. For other folks, it can involve, you know, reinforcing peers, making sure that they can uh, withstand through sea level rise and a lot of the other changes that we're experiencing along our coastline. And just by having healthier ocean ecosystems overall, more folks, particularly those that fish from shore and don't have access to boats, um, have access to a healthier ocean environment that's more productive. When we think of equitable access, most people think of just being able to get to the beach. But getting there, you should also feel like you're welcome there, that you're safe there. It's a clean, <laughs> healthy environment. At Dockweiler Beach, which is a coastal area that you often see more people of color visiting, um, it's also right where a sewage treatment plant is and there is an outflow. Um, we had a big sewage spill last summer and a lot of folks got sick because they weren't given the information to know that that water wasn't clean and safe for them to be in in that moment. Getting in the water in a marine protected area, it's immediately obvious that you're in a protected place. I mean, fish are big, there's such a great balance of different, um, of, you know, the ecosystem, the kelp is usually healthy. I see more kelp, I see more seagrass. Um, 
I remember the last time I snorkeled at Point Doom, the lobsters were just sitting in the surf grass looking at me, <laughs> knowing that they were safe and happy. Even the fish that aren't that cool that you sort of ignore elsewhere, you get into a marine protected area and you're like, oh my gosh, they're huge. <laughs> and they're everywhere. And you feel like you're more immersed in it, right? Like things aren't running away from you. I would love to have a network of marine protected areas, I mean across the world, um, but at least across the United States that's representative of different ecosystems and different habitats and for it to be accessible, equitably <laughs> accessible to everyone. If you're an ocean person and you have had opportunities to get to the ocean and learn water skills, you know, pass that on to someone who may not have had that opportunity growing up. I think most people that I know that experience the ocean have had someone, for me it was my dad, but you know, learning other skills, I've had other people in my life that have brought me into that world or brought me into a community. So I think that's really important to be able to do. A lot of people put aside the fact that you have a stake in the ocean. We are all ocean stakeholders. The ocean impacts every single person on this planet, whether you live on the coast, whether you surf or play or go to the beach regularly, or you live miles and miles inland. Through science, policy, indigenous knowledge, we have all the tools to create a better future for our planet and ourselves but we really have to act. Your connection to the places where you live and play, recharge or find peace in nature are an important part of that toolkit. You have a say in where and how areas are protected. So get involved, get engaged and share those stories. The vision for a healthy planet must come from all of us. This next short film is Frozen Ceiling, uh, directed by Perrin James. In his own words, he writes, the goal of this short piece was to explain the simplicity of a, a breath hold and the deeper thoughts in the mind when pushing your body to such limits. Here is Frozen Ceiling. Andrew is just made of something else. I don't know what it is. When I'm feeling freezing and cold, he's just getting started. It's sometimes he, like the only time I've seen him shiver is when he's actually diving under ice without a suit. Other than that, he's usually pretty, pretty solid. So I don't know what it is. It's probably his country blood or and I'm just from the city and I'm weaker, but. <laughs> It's not a lust for death, but a lust to feel alive. I try and think about what I'm doing, and for me, it's really hard to explain. In those moments, my body takes over, and the mind has to become quiet. How far do I have to push? How deep do I need to dive? We all know the point of no return, but that changes on a daily basis. Our state of mind, your physical body, 
it all adapts to the conditions that you're in on that day and on that dive. If the screams in your mind drown out the wisdom of your body, you can lose yourself. I don't think you want to ask that. That's that's the boring stuff. That's uh, I'm an accountant, so I'm kind of your typical desk job sort of thing. holding in the breath and not allowing yourself to breathe. Uh, you get these sensations in your body uh, that are quite enjoyable. Um, at the same time, they're equally quite challenging. And so I think that's the beauty of a breath hold is not only do you get this exhilaration, but you also have to face a challenge that if you can overcome, uh, you end up a stronger person. And for some reason, the breath hold can change you and uh, make you in into someone that you want to be. We're mammals and we're, we're made to be in the water and we just have to allow ourselves and kind of give up control over our minds and over our bodies and over, over life itself. And when we do that, uh, we have a very uh, rewarding experience. I'm Keenan, and this is our film called Behind the Mask. It's about the diversity fellowship that was recently created here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. We started it last summer for our master's program and have since expanded it to include all the important work going into this fellowship. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. We're all like primed and ready to start making change. We're all open to that, right? It's just, when do we start actually making those changes? And I think diversity is, you know, one of those initiatives. 
My name is Annalisa and I am a Masters of Advanced Studies student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Growing up in the Central Valley, I was in this very landlocked kind of desert area, which was super beautiful and abundant with agriculture and food. But I was taught to like stay away from the water when I was young. I found out about the diversity program at Scripps for scuba through a listserv that I got on. It was an email listserv. I was really, really excited about the possibility of doing science diving. My name is Christian McDonald. Uh, I'm the scientific diving and small boating safety officer at, at Scripps and at UC San Diego. The scope of science that is conducted at UCSD and at Scripps that involves science diving is significant, right? So uh, we have the obvious marine biologists, uh, both looking at like kelp forest ecosystems locally. Uh, we have marine science and marine biologists looking at coral reef ecosystems. Um, we really do have kind of a real diverse scope of, of research interests at, at this institution. I really think a, a, a big focus of, of scientific diving and scientific diving programs pertains to access. I think an area where I feel strongly that our scientific diving program should, should go is with, with providing access and opportunities for, for a larger and a more diverse community of, of students and faculty and researchers. One of the projects we're really happy to be supporting uh, is a student initiative um, developed by Erica Farrar and uh, Alyssa Griffin, who's a former PhD student here, now faculty at UC Davis, uh, called the Diversity Fellowship Program. My name is Erica Ferrer, and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate here in the Alberto Lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My role within the diversity program is I'm a co-founder. We've worked rather intimately with both Christian McDonald and Kiara Ozzing from the Scripps uh, Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion to get this program off the ground, working with people all over the Scripps administration to generate the funding necessary for this program, and also um, collaborating and, and working with students and divers of color who are already in the program to imagine, you know, what resources do we need to make more available um, to divers coming through the program, um, but also what are ways in which we can think more broadly about diversifying the field. When I got to UCSD and scoped around the Scripps part of campus, I realized definitely wanted to figure out a way to do research that also kept me out in the field and got me working with my hands as, as much as my head. And so when I realized there was a dive program, just knew it was going to be a mission of mine to get that as part of my foundation. I'm Mohamed Sederat. I'm a third year PhD student now here in Jen Smith's lab. At Scripps, we've got a great history of scientific diving, and I would love to see it continue to grow. Now we've got other barriers that I think are fresh on everyone's mind, and institutions as a whole are figuring out how to navigate that. So yeah, I, I hope as, as long as I'm around, I could do my part to, to help keep those doors opening rather than getting more constrained. I, I'm really new to diving and I really love the side diving class. It was a really nice space to be in with other people that also are looking to level up their skills, are doing so many different things. I just had this moment of kind of like realization and pause where I was like, oh, this is going to change everything for me. With this inaugural class, we have a little bit of everything. Uh, some of our fellows uh, are, like Annalisa, was, was ready to go with our scientific diving course. Um, and we're continuing to work with, with others to coordinate swim proficiency training and then mentoring them to the point where they're ready for our scientific diving course. But I think there's work to be done, to be honest, in like how we think about and support uh, particularly our students of, of color um, who, are, who are going out into to the world in order to, to do their science. You know, I'm a diving guy and a water guy, so I recognize the limitations of my expertise. Um, I've been doing this long enough to, to see the impact of these, these other issues uh, on our students, researchers, and faculty. There's two pieces that I, I think would make uh, diversity all that much more successful and, and one is bringing in someone to implement the program whose role and responsibility really is to act as a primary point of contact uh, for recruiting students, for mentoring students, for uh, sort of guiding them through the whole of their experience. And the, the other piece is what next? We're working on that piece now where, where we could better sort of 
develop with our faculty and students, uh, research opportunities uh, in-house within the Scripps Scientific Diving researcher or research community, um, but also farther afield or, or outside of our immediate community. I'm really inspired by the fact that now that this fellowship exists, there are people that are signing up that have zero skills or experience. I really commend them for jumping out on a limb, trying something that maybe no one that they know has done. And even if eventually, you know, this is not something that's for life for them, or they just, you know, can't do it all their lives, I still think it's a really amazing experience. There's so many ways to do science and there, we don't always have to do it in this way that's like divorced from community or doesn't somehow figure out what questions communities might already be asking. I would like to see a world where scientific diving is uh, not only more accessible from a scientific point of view, but um, just more open culturally where everyone feels like they not only uh, can participate in that research, um, but get to enjoy just like the sheer fun that comes with uh, diving underwater. Well, I feel so incredibly honored to be moderating this panel with some incredible filmmakers and individuals who were featured in some of our films. I don't know about you guys, but after watching all of that, I'm like, I wanna go diving, I wanna go fishing, I wanna go surfing, let's get in the water. Um, so before we do any of that, let's dive into questions. Um, and before I dive into questions, I'll introduce each of our panelists. So first we have Mo, who was featured in Behind the Mask, and he is a PhD student here at Scripps. Then we have Keenan, who was the filmmaker for Behind the Mask, and he's a master's student here. Then we have Andrea, who is the co-founder of Surfgrass Production, and uh, the filmmaker for Shared Seas. And lastly, we have Anupa, who is the Senior Ocean Advocate at Natural Resource Defense Council and featured in Shared Seas. So the first question that I want to ask is for the filmmakers, and I'll start with you, Andrea. What inspired you to tell this story? Sure, so I think for me, the inspiration came from multiple points. One was um, marine protected areas are something I'm really passionate about. Um, they weren't something that I knew about before coming to. I, I was also, I'm an alumni of Scripps, and it just wasn't really something that I was aware of before coming into the program. And there are such magical places where, you know, you go in the water and you just see the biodiversity and you just have this really intimate access to these marine spaces. And I wanted to share that with other people who, again, you know, may not come from the ocean space, who aren't doing ocean work. And so this was a chance for me to show them what is what can be found off of our coast in California and, and really um, you know all along the west coast and in other places as well um, the second thing is that um, you know in a lot of the work we do through surfcraft productions we're working with other nonprofits to tell stories that they want to tell and so when this grant opportunity through Hispanic Access Foundation opened up, it was a chance for Lindsay and I to pitch a story that we were excited about. And so I knew right away that I wanted to do something around marine protected areas and also to find a subject who um, could be a good messenger for that piece. And I think, you know, a lot of times the people that we work with are, um, you know, we've done films with fishers in the past and you tend to get, you know, what you picture, a salty older guy who's doing fishing, um, you know, as part of his profession. And so we really wanted to find somebody who could tell a different fishing perspective. And I'd actually read articles that Anupa had written about being an ocean advocate and a fisher. And I thought, 
she would be perfect for, for the kind of story that we were looking to tell. So we reached out to her um, and she was excited about it. And so we ended up pitching it as our film project to the Hispanic Access Foundation. Wow, that's super awesome. I definitely feel like it gave us a picture into marine protected areas from a unique perspective. And to that point, I would like to ask you, Anupa, to describe a little bit of what first drew you to the ocean. Like, how did that feel? You talked a little bit about your experience fishing with your father. And then also, um, what drew you to care so much about marine protected areas and to be an advocate for them? Um, those are some in-depth questions there, Ellen. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, as I mentioned in the film, I grew up fishing. My dad loved to fish, and so it was just sort of the thing that we did together every weekend. Um, I was actually just back home in Florida for Thanksgiving, and I did a lot of fishing with my dad again. Um, so, I mean, it was just sort of the thing to do, and it was my gateway into all these other ocean activities that I've come to learn and love over the years, from surfing to diving. Um, what's funny is I actually, when I first moved to California, I went to UCLA to go to film school. And I took an oceanography class just to get my science credit out of the way, not realizing it was a thing that I could do. And that sort of changed everything for me. So um, yeah, fishing really opened up a lot of doors for me. And then from there, I've had a career in marine science and conservation and working to protect some of the areas that I love to visit and I love to spend time in um, when I'm not working. Did I answer all of your questions? There was another one. Yeah, no, I think that was a really great explanation of your connection with the ocean and marine protected areas. And we'll come back to talking okay. about the importance of marine protected areas. Um, that was really interesting to hear that you initially were uh, going to film school and then took that marine biology class and switched. So Keenan, I wanted to ask you, as a master's student here at Scripps, what inspired you to make this film and tell this story? Yeah, we, um, as part of my master's program, uh, in the summer we were tasked with making a film. And um, we were, my group and I were lucky enough to um, be tasked with interviewing Christian. And, um, you know, we did an interview with Christian early on just to kind of get an idea of what um, kind of story we wanted to, to create. And, um, you know, Christian is, is very humble and, and wanted to make sure that, you know, the film wasn't about him necessarily. And so um, we had to figure out a way to, to tell a story um, with him, uh, but also, you know, not concentrate just on him. And so uh, we had heard about the Diversity Fellowship um, and I had uh, a friend who, Erica, you saw, um, who um, helped create the program. And so I, I knew a little bit about it through her. And then we also had, um, we have a, uh, one of the people in our cohort, Annalisa, um, who was going through the, the fellowship. So we decided to try to highlight this um, kind of new uh, fellowship. Um, and we really just kind of learned a lot along the way and um, were able to interview some really cool people like Mo. And that's a great transition to ask you, Mo, what drew you to um, scientific diving? I know you mentioned you're a PhD student here, but you also did your master's in undergrad here. And so did you dive before coming here? What drew you to that and what keeps you in it? Sure, yeah, so definitely was recreationally certified to dive starting in early high school. Did it in Boy Scouts actually on Catalina Island. That was super fun. It was definitely a good gateway into realizing it's something I wanted to keep doing. And if, when I realized that I could make it part of my career, troubleshooting in the water, solving problems based in the science that I was interested in, I figured out a way in undergrad to, to kind of latch on to a part of that and kept going in my master's. So. It's, it's exciting to be able to be a PhD student and have work grounded in the kelp forest uh, that requires diving. That's really cool. I want to ask you, what were some challenges you may have faced doing scientific diving? Maybe some precarious situations or some interesting questions? Is Christian here? <laughs> 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 yeah, so the great thing is that we are trained pretty well um, through the program to to get in places, to not be in, find ourselves in places that, that are dangerous and to be able to, to act rather than react to situations that might you know, be a surprise. Um, so I wouldn't say that 
there's been precarious situations so much. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think that answer would be the same even if our DSO weren't here. So, yeah. Okay, noted. Yeah. Um, so then I guess I'll take the same sort of question to you, Anupa. What are some challenges that you see in the space of creating marine protected areas right now? I know that's a huge question, but I'll leave it open for you for how you want to answer that. Oh, um, I, I mean, I think most people that work in ocean conservation, you're up against the fishing industry and these fishing interest groups that are mostly made of people that don't look like me. <laughs> Um, and it's sort of this mentality that they are the people that get to make decisions about what happens in the ocean because it affects them more than everyone else. So a lot of the, the work that I do um, is trying to make space for everyone to be a part of those conversations and empower people to say like, hey, I love the ocean too and this matters to me and having healthy intact ecosystems are something that I wanna continue to see and I want my children to continue to see. Um, and I talked a little bit about um, equitable access in the film. And I mean, the, the sort of glib answer there, right, is it makes my job easier. <laughs> if more people are welcome to these spaces and they get a chance to experience them, then we have more people that are willing to, to kind of say like, hey, I, I want to stand up for this and I want to support this conservation effort. Um, but again, like, you know, that's how we get more stewards of the ocean. And I think it's just, it's so, so important to make sure that we're creating not just like the physical access in getting to the beach, but let's create a safe space. Are there lifeguards at the beach? Are there people there that can tell, you know, educate you on what the hazards are or what the protected, you know, what kinds of activities you can do in a particular space? That's all part of access and I think should be part of the conversation. Yeah, it was definitely really interesting to me in the film when you talked about how it's not just physical access, it's also feeling comfortable when you get into that space. Mm -hmm. And I feel a large part of feeling comfortable in a space is seeing yourself in that space. And a powerful tool to do that is through filmmaking. So Andrea, I want to ask you, how do we tell these stories of, I mean, you did a beautiful job with Anupa's story, but like going forward for other filmmakers, what advice do you have in telling these stories of making marine protected areas more equitable and all of that? Sure, so I would say, I mean, make, you know, make films that mean something to you that it, that you think will inspire others. You know, if you notice a trend in the kinds of protagonists that there are in films or the topic areas, um, you know, find the stories that haven't been told and, and get a charismatic lead to, to be your storyteller. And two, I think, um, you know, finding different venues to share those films in, like Salty Cinema, the fact that somebody created this, you know, tells you that there was a need for a space where we could share stories about the ocean. Um, and I think, you know, this is one film festival and there are many others out there. There's Latino film festivals, San Diego hosts one, um, for example. And so finding who, who your audience is, who, who you want to hear the story, and making sure that your film gets into those spaces and is accessible to people who, again, you want to hear this story. So I think, too, something that we'd like to do moving forward, um, you know, with this film, we were a little bit constrained by time, but is like providing, you know, subtitles for the movies so that a different audience can access your film and not just folks who are English language speakers. Yeah, I definitely think making films more accessible through subtitles and all of that, that's a really cool way to make marine protected areas and others more accessible. Um, and talking of diversifying, I wanted to ask you, Keenan, um, what does diversifying diving mean to you and like why is it important that we do that? Yeah, I think that it's um, a really interesting topic because um, you know, you see a lot of uh, famous, uh, you know, divers, Cousteau and, you know, the likes. And so they're, they're all, a lot of them are old white men. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm part Chinese and, uh, you know, there's not really people out there that, uh, I guess, look like me that are, that are divers um, kind of doing things. And I myself am a diver. 
um, a science diver as well. And, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of um, barriers getting into um, science diving. Um, you know, just the cost straight up is, is expensive. Um, and you need to, to have um, kind of those certifications going into it uh, just to, to be able to do science diving. And so um, I think that, you know, one of the, our goals with this film was really to just try to illuminate uh, a really kind of new and cool growing program that um, is trying to address that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an important time to, to kind of be talking about this because, um, you know, there, there are still barriers out there, but the fact that, um, you know, program and a fellowship like uh, the diversity program exists is, is really cool. Um, and something that we really, we really would like to, you know, let people know about. Yeah, um, I definitely really stuck to the moment um, when I believe Andrea was her name. She said, "This is going to change everything for me." After describing her experience scuba diving, um, and so Mo, I wanted to ask you, how do we bring this opportunity to more people? I know this is a new program, but what areas of growth do you see? I think it's hard to pick, we have to start picking it apart little by little. Mm. I think the, f the biggest part mentioned in the movie is for people to realize that this is a tool that's out there to help us do our science. So, so diving is something, at least in the scientific community, um, we're, not, we're not out there just to dive. We're, we're out here to do our science. And when our science brings us to, to parts of the ocean that requires us to, to be able to dive, that's when we begin to, to do science diving. Mm -hmm. And so I think the problem is a little bit further upstream. It's, first of all, are there barriers to becoming a scientist at an institution in, t in the terms of diversity? Mm -hmm. And assuming a student can, from a diverse background, can begin to be a student here at the university, then they want to dive. There, there are barriers there as well. Funding is definitely one that Keenan mentioned, but the fellowship now helps with that, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think we have to start zooming out and, and make sure we're considering the different approaches to becoming a student in a university doing research mm -hmm. beyond college, mm -hmm. uh, you know, beyond high school, beyond college, mm -hmm. um, before we can then start thinking about, about diving. But it, it's important to also be thinking about it in parallel too. So mm -hmm. we make progress in steps mm -hmm. kind of moving forward mm -hmm. from all these different branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think breaking big issues into small steps is like makes it much more manageable and just like feel like you can do something about it. I feel like another thing that helps you feel that you're making an impact and do something about it is to hear like little rewarding moments. And so I'm gonna go back to Anupa and ask if you have any stories or examples where you have been able to create equitable access to the beach or marine protected areas or anything like that, you know, just some inspiration. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a couple of things come to mind, but um, the, the program that I'm involved in, I do a lot of work with the Surfrider Foundation, um, and the Los Angeles chapter has this really great program called One Watershed, where we bring um, kids that don't have the opportunity to learn otherwise. Um, we bring them to the beach and give them free surf lessons. They have wetsuits. We create a safe space for them to feel comfortable in the water. Um, we have lunch and sunscreen and all the things that you need to be at the beach for the day. <laughs> and they get to play in the ocean, and we get to play in the ocean with them. And for so many of them, it's the first chance that they have been to the beach, and they live in a beautiful beach city. Um, and for many kids, they come back and they ask when they can come back and, you know, it kind of opens up this lifelong love of the ocean, which is amazing. Um, I also used to teach marine science out on Catalina and I have so many stories of, you know, having these amazing moments with like a cool wildlife encounter with a kid who also has never been to the ocean, much less get on a boat and go to an island and put on a wetsuit and a mask and snorkel and get in the water, which was my favorite part of that job. So. Oh my gosh, I definitely want to grab a beer with you and hear more of those stories because those are my favorite. Um, so I was wondering, I wanted to go back to you, Keenan, of any rewarding moments that you had either in the production of this film or just in general doing scientific diving and with a particular focus on diversity. 
I think that um, just the film in general was, was felt rewarding to us. Um, this was our first film, um, and so uh, just kind of the accomplishment of, of putting something out there, um, we were pretty stoked on. Um, I learned a lot <laughs> about how to edit and everything like that, or film, or um, deal with sound. So I think that that was um, an accomplishment for, for all of us um, that were working on this project. Um, and I, th I think, remind me of the question, uh, accomplishments, is that? <laughs> I mean, making a film is a huge accomplishment, yeah. so props for that, definitely. Um, but it was just like rewarding moments. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was um, super excited to be able to interview, um, you know, the, the folks that we got to interview and, and get to know them a little bit more, right? Um, you know, getting to know Mo a little bit um, and kind of hearing about his work. We have a lot of um, kind of similar backgrounds in, in what we've done in the past. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's just been, been really cool to to work with all the people that we got to work with on this project and really learn from all of them because um, everybody does have a different background and, and um, thoughts and opinions and, and life stories. So that was all uh, really cool to, to hear and learn about. Awesome. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, know that you can learn a lot through the filmmaking process and really get to know some of the people that you're working with. So that's cool that that was some of your most rewarding moments. Um, so, with one of the last questions, Andrea, I will ask you, what do you hope is the impact of your film going forward? I definitely hope that people will go out and visit their local marine protected area and, you know, see what the fuss and the magic is all about. Um, I hope, too, that, you know, we mentioned in the film 30 by 30, which is this initiative to protect 30% of lands and waters by 2030. And right now, you know, the state of California is figuring out what that means and what that looks like. And so there are opportunities to provide feedback and, you know, to have a say in, in what we protect and, and how. And so, you know, follow those opportunities, look into um, what it means to you to have access, to be able to, um, to go into these places and, and to, you know, I think see a, an even more protected coastline um, that has a, a benefit, not just to folks who recreate there, but also to fishers. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, I think now for the next 10 minutes, we are going to open up questions to the audience. So if you guys have any burning questions that you wanna ask to our filmmakers or the people that were featured, feel free to raise your hand and we will pass around the microphone. And we're also taking questions from people online. Don't be shy. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, how much time do you think you spent researching what you're going to do, and then how much time filming, and then how much time editing? Roughly, roughly. That's a great question. Um, I would say the research piece probably took us, you know, from the time before we even applied to the grant opportunity, it was a good month or two of conversation, of thinking about what the story would look like. Um, once we were actually filming, that was done over two days. So we did one day where we interviewed Anuba and then another day where we went out fishing with her, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then the editing piece, I feel like usually it takes us a lot longer on some of our films. You know, we'll be editing for three or four months. Um, this one we were constrained by the, the grant deadlines and so I think we did it over maybe a month or two. It was a pretty quick process. Um, I have a little bit of a different take, I guess. Um, we were given a week to, to make the film. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot. Um, and then we, we ended up building it out a little bit by um, interviewing um, Christian and Annalisa. So that took um, another day total. Um, and then um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, we kind of put it all together yesterday um, <laughs> and uh, so maybe a little bit of a different take but um, we got it done <laughs> uh, 
I think there's a question in the back. Hi, yes, uh, panelists. This is from the Q&A on our online chat. Uh, Jennifer asks, I am new to San Diego area and a non-scientist who has a passion for the ocean and marine conservation. Do you have any specific suggestions about how I can get involved in a local level? Really enjoy the films. Thank you. Um, so to answer that question, I would say look for your local organizations that are working in this space. So as Anupa mentioned, you know, Surfrider LA has a chapter. We actually have a, a Surfrider San Diego chapter, there's San Diego Coast Keeper. There's a ton of organizations here because we live on the coast that, that are doing work. So I think think about what, um, you know, what it is you want to do, if you want to do trash cleanups, if you want to do citizen science, and then find the organizations locally, I think. A lot of organizations are on Instagram right now. That's how I find out about opportunities. So encourage you to, to look there as well. Um, I'll also make a plug for another local um, nonprofit for that's women founded and run called Changing Tides Foundation. And they have this really awesome mentorship opportunity for young girls um, in the summertime, bringing them out to the beach regularly to learn how to surf and have these like continued lessons. Leah Dawson is a pro surfer from this area and she's one of the co-founders, so it's pretty cool to get to learn how to surf from Leah, I think. Um, so I encourage you to check them out. It's Changing Tides Foundation. I think there's a question up top. Yes, thank you and uh, thanks for the filmmakers for showing your work. Always inspiring to see you creators uh, showing your work with the world. Um, and that's kind of like my question and you mentioned it a little bit. How do you get your films out there? Where do you find the film festivals? How do you yeah, get your work out in the public? Do you have any tips on that as a filmmaker, or as a producer? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, film festivals are definitely one way. Um, there's a website called Film Freeway, which has like a long, long list of all kinds of different film festivals, not just environmental. Um, and so we look for opportunities through that. You know, sometimes we, I would say most of the time, we have a film already, and then we look to see what film festivals are a fit. But you can also do it the opposite way, where you see a film festival and you think, I want to make sure that I get something in there in the coming years. Um, I would also say too, we look to our nonprofit partners that we usually collaborate on films with to share through their networks, um, not just with the public that follows them, but also with organizations that they're working with. So in this case with our film, obviously NRDC uh, helped support it, and so they were able to share it through their channels. Um, and then we have other organizations um, who are interested in showing our films to the public that they work with. Um, so we look for those opportunities where you know, we have a topic area, a film uh, topic that might be of interest to a certain nonprofit doing a certain kind of work, and so we'll we'll share that with them and give them the opportunity to showcase it if it's something that they're interested in. Well, what's the name of that website again? Film Freeway. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, up there. Hi, um, Mo, would you mind describing your research and also explaining why uh, you need to dive for your research? Sure, so I spend most of my time in the kelp forests, especially the handful we have off of San Diego, off of La Jolla and Point Loma, and there's also this tiny little artificial reef that keeps trying to recruit kelp. Uh, but I'm interested in fluctuations in the kelp forest population uh, the, the forest itself um, over the course of long-term and interannual climate change. So there, there are these marine heat waves that we've been getting more and more of, and every single one has kind of been a little bit more intense uh, in ways that, especially in Northern California, um, has changed the entire ecosystems, shifted them toward, from kelp forests to urchin barrens, for example. Um, in Southern California, for example, the last marine heat wave that we had, um, that El Nino in 2015, 2016, uh, we lost all the kelp in San Diego, but it, it did come back, which is very dissimilar to what we experienced in Northern California. Although just now we are starting to get a little bit more of the bull kelp that is uh, more pervasive up there. Um, so the, the question is, why did our kelp bounce back in San Diego? Um, will it bounce back again in the future? And you know, how much of that can we get an answer of when we look at the genomes, for example? How much of that is a selection? Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. The diving. Oh, the diving part. So, so the diving part of that, um, 
when I go down into these ecosystems, I can't hold my breath as long as a lot of the free divers out there. And a lot of, which is, you know, that's fine. Uh, a lot of the surveys that I do are benthically conducted. Um, so I'm, I'm doing surveys of the seafloor inside kelp forests and outside of them, looking at differences in understory algal assemblages um, and looking at invertebrates that you, you want to know differences in abundance with respect to grazing pressure, for example. Um, so, so a lot of that work requires diving on scuba uh, to conduct multitudes of surveys. And another kind of side um, need for diving is my work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife doing abalone conservation in the kelp forest. And all these uh, different projects, especially centered around abalone, require us to be able to, at some point, after doing the surveys that we just talked about, put abalone out um, on the seafloor and then return to see survival rate, for example, and, and how well they're distributing and, and engaging with their habitat. Right up here. How well are they doing? <laughs> the abalone. So the white abalone, which one of the first invertebrates to, to be put on the endangered species list, they're not doing that great. And, and the abalone that we used to be able to fish, the, the last bubble of that fishery in Northern California closed in 2016. Um, so, in, you know, from a fishery standpoint, not too well. Um, from a conservation standpoint, we just stay just about the same. Uh, but if we think about success stories like the California condor, um, you know, with, with population numbers much lower than what we're seeing with the abalone, at least, along the California coast, there is still hope. And, and fortunately, there are still people that see that with um, with funding resources to, to help people keep trying to, to restore the populations. So we're, we're getting closer to, to trying to reverse this downward trend, but it's still not looking great. When Walter Monk came in 1939, they spent the whole summer having every meal off the pier with abalone, and he could never look at them again. Right, right, right. It, were, there, were they abalone off the Scripps Pier at the time, too? That's amazing, just to think about that intertidal zone and, and imagining that there were abalone there, let alone shells, but, you know. Maybe. He was sure, yeah, there's that, too, yeah. I can add that I grew up here, and I was so sick of abalone as a kid that I've never had it since. <laughs> and they were right off the reefs, right off the marine room. I have a question, and that's the, the sea urchin population that attacks the kelp uh, up I'm only aware of it from re uh, reports in the Monterey Bay area. <clears throat> With a changing climate, is that going to be a threat down here? Do you see them migrating down here at all? So we have urchin populations here as well, and including a fishery that revolves around it. So they're already here. Um, the question is, with these increasing uh, warming events and potentially not just having more warming events, but just longer periods of warming, um, we're, there are issues where macro giant kelp itself is going to have a hard time surviving on its own. Forget about having grazers like urchins in that picture as well. Uh, so, so we are looking at how these shifts in the ecosystem because of higher temperatures for longer periods of time might make kelp less resilient to, to just the normal pressures in its environment, let alone grazing uh, forces that you know, are introduced by urchin. Um, one thing that's different here that, you know, as opposed to Northern California, um, the, sh the, urchins, the urchin barren shifted and, and came into to being a big problem before it was a kelp forest. Uh, I should back up. The kelp forest environment shifted into an urchin barren in Northern California a little bit e more easily because the predation effort on all those urchins had di diminished greatly in, in previous years. Um, some of the, most of those are anthropogenically tied. So human um, uh, hunting of sea otters for their pelts, for example, that was one pressure that um, we don't have up in Northern California as much. And then sea stars, which also are a great um, force on you know, reducing or keeping that urchin population in check, that's, coast, that's a coastal-wide problem. They were wasting away um, right around the time of these warming events in 2016. And, and so the populations of sea stars in San Diego, Southern California in general, are kind of coming back after that wasting event. Um, but there's questions of if, with warming temperatures, could we experience more of these disease outbreaks where um, 
predatory checks on grazers like urchins might be reduced, and then we have the same problem that Northern California does over here in our backyard. And all of that is examples for why 30 by 30 is an important initiative <laughs> to Andre and Anupa's documentary. <laughs> um, I have a question about the great white sharks in our kelp beds. <laughs> I don't really want to call them great white sharks because I think we do that to them. So the white sharks, um, are they populating more because of the warmer seas? First of all, do you want to take that because of your channel on this background? Or I don't want to hog the, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to. I, I think you, you can, I don't know China, China or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm also not going to claim to be a shark expert. Um, I don't know if, if Andy's in the room right now, but yeah. I bet they see me, I'll be honest, on every single dive. I. I haven't seen any, any white sharks personally. Um, what's interesting is either they're more, I don't know if it's more on our radar now because of all the underwater footage that's been coming out recently. There's, there's some biting footage that's been coming out. I don't, I don't, I don't know that we're, our concern is so much of, of them biting us. I've, I've heard there's so much drone footage coming out now where they're hanging out with all the surfers, just minding their own business. They're more curious than anything. I think continues to be the narrative that I see no reason to disagree with at this point. Yeah. So I go into the ocean as well as the sharks. As we all do, yes. <laughs> I think there's another question from online. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Uh, yes, our question from Hassan online, how do you relate your work to saving the planet due to climate change? And um, I'll just add, uh, as an event organizer, I think the last two questions were definitely already related to climate change, but maybe we can broaden out to um, uh, Ellen or, or Anupa or Andrea, um, Keenan, Mo, if you have additional things you want to say about climate change. Um, but once again, this is uh, how do you relate your work to saving the planet due to climate change? Anupa, you want to take that? Sure. Um, I mean, Climate change is the existential threat, right? Like, we, fishing is a big driver of bio, biodiversity loss in our ocean, and development and climate change are right behind that. Um, most of the issues that we face in our ocean are tied back to climate change. So, you know, the work that I do, I feel like is important, but at the end of the day, if we don't solve for climate change, the work that I do is not gonna have as much of an impact as it could. Um, marine protected areas in particular, and when we're looking at that through the lens of the 30 by 30 campaign, right, that is the solution to protect marine life, to protect biodiversity while we deal with those climate change issues, while we figure out ways to reduce our emissions and reduce our impact. Um, you know, like creating these spaces where animals can recover animals and plants can recover free from additional human impact, right? Places where they can f uh, adapt to the changes in their environment. Um, that's, that's the important key to, to solving for climate change and stopping biodiversity loss as those changes are happening. I think I answered the question. And I just wanna add, I think Obviously, climate change is one of the biggest problems we're facing, but oftentimes the ocean is left out of the discussion when addressing climate change. And while the ocean is one of the uh, areas that's facing some of the biggest problems due to climate change, the ocean can also be one of the biggest solutions to addressing climate change. It's one of the largest carbon sinks. It retains uh, a large majority of the excess heat that's released, I'm sure you guys all know this very well, You're, we're at Scripps, one of the best institutions for studying this, but I just wanna highlight that. Um, and doing things like marine protected areas, restoring mangroves, restoring seagrass is a huge part of the solution to addressing climate change. It also helps us, it gives us a space to learn and study how things are changing. Um, separate from these additional impacts of taking things from the ocean, right? Like, and that's so important to further finding new solutions to how we can continue to move forward. Yeah, is there another question from online? I think Hassan has a follow-up. So the question is, what can we do as a community to work with you as experts to save the planet? I love that, what can we do? 
take advantage of all of these moments to like give public comment and make your decision makers hear you. They, your elected officials work for you. Make sure they know it, right? If something is, a, is a, an important issue for you, if you want to push for important solutions like marine protected areas, um, do that. Um, NRDC, Surfrider, Scripps, right? Like follow along, um, whether it's through social media or whatever, we'll be sharing as best we can those opportunities for you to get involved and make, involved and make your voice heard. Um, if you are, you know, if you get emails from a nonprofit that you've donated to or you've just signed up to an email list, like click those emails and sign those petitions. Um, the folks that work for those organizations are often talking to your elected officials quite regularly. It helps me a lot if I can go to them and say like, hey, a thousand people are behind this effort or however many people um, actually sign this petition and say that they support you know, having a marine protected area here or this particular bill or policy, right? So don't overlook those things as spam in your inbox. Um, take a moment and sign them if it's something that matters to you. And just to build off of that, I think even more basic, just vote, you know? Like, yes. I think that is one of the biggest ways in addition to signing petitions and uh, adding public comment is to have your voice heard look at which representatives are supporting current pieces of legislation that align with your values of you know taking care of our ocean and and vote for those and california we have so many propositions but a lot of them also impact the ocean and so i think it's really important and valuable to to read about them prepare yourself educate yourself and then if you want to go the extra mile educate your friends and your family and get them to vote as well Any other questions? I'm going to take this opportunity. Thank you guys for, for everything that was happening here. I want to add that, that you're talking about voting in action, but with this, uh, this was a film festival about water people and about enjoying the ocean. So let's start with the love of the ocean. Let's start by getting our feet wet tomorrow. It's cold, but we saw some people in a lot colder water. How about that? <laughs> Ellen, thank you very much. Panelists, thank you so much. This was, this was excellent. I want to thank the, the support that we've gotten to host Salty Cinema, and this is without that, uh, we wouldn't be able to be here tonight. And I, I want to thank all of you for, for caring and loving, about, uh, loving the ocean. Uh, Nikki and Loria, thanks for uh, the, leading the team, the Salty Cinema team. I think you guys did a great job. And to celebrate the great job and to continue these conversations and to imagine getting our feet wet, let's get our shoulders wet, enjoy some refreshments outside and continue the conversations. Thanks everybody for being here.